Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, members. If you could be drawing yourselves to attention and, and sitting down, please. All right. First, a few housekeeping notes. There is no fire drill scheduled this evening, which is fortunate, as it's getting a bit nippy out there. So if the fire alarm does go off, it probably is the real thing. So I think our Democratic Services Officer has now been fully trained in what to do in those circumstances. So she will find out a safe route of the building and hopefully come back and tell us what it is. I'm not sure I would once I got out of a burning building. Secondly, may I ask if anyone is intending to record this meeting, we have our own council webcast system. This is not to stop anyone recording, but simply so that we know it's taking place. I don't see anyone indicating, so I will assume that is a no. On with the business for the evening. First of all, apologies for absence. Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies from councillors Powell, Bizard, and Mrs. Stockel. Thank you very much indeed. I have also received apologies for Councillor Ferber, who is hoping to get here to speak to the first planning application on the agenda, but is not here yet. Is it agreed that she can speak if she arrives in time? Thank you. Item two, notification of substitute members. First of all, Councillor Wilby. Yep, uh, Councillor Wilby substituting for Brian Vizard. Thank you very much. And Councillor Butler. Yeah, Councillor Butler for Councillor Mrs. Stockall. Thank you very much indeed. Item three, notification of visiting members. I can see a number over the back there. <laughs> Councillor Webb, you were first. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Councillor Springy. Thank you very much. Councillor Grigg. Councillor Lewins. Thank you. Councillor Willis, I think I can see you lurking. Thank you very much. Is that everyone? I think it is. Yes, good. Right. Item four, items withdrawn from the agenda. Now, there may be people here for some items that have been rolled over, so please listen carefully, so, because I will only say this once. Item 15, page 21, land rear of chart view off chart Hill Road, chart Sutton, will be heard next week. As will item 16, land south of Vicarage Road, Yielding. Item 23, land south of Avery Lane and land south of Sutton Road, Ottom. Item 24, Church Farm, Oakham Hill, Oakham. And finally, item 25, Orchard Farm Nursery, Chartway Street, Sutton Valence. If anyone is here for any of those items, I apologise, but due to the enormous length of this agenda, they are being heard next week. Okay. So I'm assuming everyone's here for the right items. Good. To grieve members that these are rolled over to next week. Thank you very much. Right, as I've sort of already said, the adjourned meeting will be next Thursday, the 16th of November, same time, same place. Item six, any business the chairman regards as urgent, including the urgent update report as it relates to matters to be considered at this meeting. Councillor Bolton will be delighted to see the extreme shortness of this week's urgent update report, but despite that, is it agreed we take it, members? Thank you. Item seven, disclosures by members and officers. I don't see any. Item eight, disclosures of lobbying. We will take those with the applications, as otherwise we will get hopelessly confused. Item 9, to consider whether any item should be taken in private because of the possible disclosure of exempt information. There's very little on the agenda that would need to be taken in part two, but if we do need to consider details of legal advice, and we do have one application where that might be relevant, we will be going into part two. 
to discuss that if necessary. I hope it will not be. All other items will be taken in public. Move on to item 10, meetings of the minutes of the meeting held on the 19th of October. These sh should have all been circulated and seen. Are there any corrections to those minutes or can we adopt them as a true and accurate record? Thank you very much. I'll sign those later then. Item 11, presentation of petitions, if any. Do we have any? We will have one at the adjourned meeting, but not tonight, apparently. Item 12, reference from the Policy and Resources Committee, Budget Monitoring Report, Development Control Appeals. I intend to, to take that next week as well, um, with members' agreement, rather than this evening. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. We move now to item 13, deferred items. Mr. Bailey, is there any update on the exciting list of deferred items? Um, some of those items are on the agendas um, for this committee and in, in relation to the other two items. Obviously, we are right, awaiting some ecological survey information on the first one and obviously um, defer the, on the other one about the deferred um, item for a layout. So um, we're currently awaiting that information. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bailey. We now turn our attention to the planning applications for this evening. And the first one is item 19 on page 73, land south of Falstall Lane, Coxheath, Kent, which is one of those deferred items that we just referred to. I ask the officer to introduce the report. Thank you, Chair. This is an application for land south of Forstall Lane in Coxheath. It was heard at the 14th of September committee and it relates to an outline application for 210 dwellings together with access off Forstall Lane, uh, 1.85 hectares of open space and associated infrastructure. Um, the application was deferred on the 14th for further uh, investigation into a, a southern access through the Willow Grange new estate, uh, the possibility of contributions for a late night bus service, uh, contributions to Southborough um, Primary School, whether that's appropriate having regard to Coxheath Primary School, um, uh, further issue regarding the open space and getting a more rounded um, boundary with the housing and open space whether the open space can incorporate woodland and um, scrub it to soften views and enable further habitat for wildlife. Um, just to provide a context since the uh, change of circumstances, perhaps in, since the previous committee, is that the adopted plan, or oh, the plan is now adopted, whereas before it was uh, considered emerging, but it, the decision on the 25th of October was to adopt the plan. Um, so essentially the context of this application is, is an allocated site within the development boundary for Coxheath and the, uh, the policy context, as you know from the pre previous report, which was an appendix, but um, uh, a more, perhaps more, most significantly is the access to be taken from Forstall Lane only. So the context is that's the development plan and planning law dictates that decisions should be taken in accordance with the development plan unless uh, uh, material, other material considerations um, suggest otherwise. So essentially, um, I think as you'll probably agree, the principal issue for the deferral was the access issue. Um, the applicant has engaged in that process. Uh, he has met with the, the landowner of one of the ransom strips uh, to discuss the costs and figures of, of how much that would uh, um, be. That has been reported in the, in the, uh, up, uh, the deferral report. Um, and also a costing of that alternative route, which is essentially, according to the applicant's figures, uh, approximately three, 350,000 uh, more than the uh, improvements to, to Forstall Lane. Um, there are also um, sort of further um, 
uh, Ransom Strip on the countryside site, uh, the, the, um, the south of the other Ransom Strip. So there's essentially two landowners that um, hold a ransom over this development, essentially. Um, so essentially, I think it's probably appropriate now just after we go to the urgent update, which perhaps spoiled your um, wish for no urgent updates. <laughs> um, it's essentially um, further consultations that have come in sort of since the report was written. Uh, a couple from local residents. Uh, sorry, luckily it wasn't me. <laughs> um, obviously, two that object to the alternative access through uh, the new estate from people who are occupying those properties. A further uh, objection from someone uh, objecting to the forcible lane um, application and uh, a further uh, respondent requesting conditions if you were to approve the application. Um, Coxheath have uh, um, made representations they weren't notified. And there's uh, been further letters from uh, DHA planning and countryside properties in respect of the applicant's evidence in respect to this alternative for access. Obviously, uh, disputing figures. Um, uh, weight of opinion, it's all set out there if you've had a, a, um, a read. Um, obviously, I've had, there's been a rebuttal from the agent quite um, understandably, um, saying obviously the opposite, <laughs> saying that there's uh, um, obviously the figures were um, um, confirmed at the meeting. Um, and perhaps most importantly, of the assertion by DHA planning that the applicant isn't a house builder, so any costs would be taken off the land value. Uh, Charthouse are engaged with uh, Chartway Group, which is a local building um, company as part of a joint venture. So essentially, there is a there is a developer in, in, in um, sort of on board, um, and also uh, the uh, issue of whether a fresh application would be um, required if the members were to uh, go or prefer the alternative access. The DHA point is that it, it wouldn't need a fresh application. The applicant said it would. Um, as I said in the urgent update, I believe it would need a new application because of the fundamental change to the application, not, with, not for many a reason, um, as set out in the, the update. Um, so turning on to the access issue, as I said, the applicant has, has uh, met with landowners, costed it, but the, it falls back to that point. You have to take um, um, the development plan, which is only just over two weeks old, um, which says forced lane only. Um, that route has been subject to um, an improvement scheme, which has been reviewed by the statutory consultee, KCC Highways, and they consider that, uh, those improvements and that access to be acceptable. So that's the starting point. As, as I said, planning law then says there has to be material considerations why that access should not be taken. Um, obviously, um, if I go through to the master plan, I've already said about the, are there any alternatives or material considerations? Well, first of all, there's two ransom strips. So from a planning perspective, it's undeliverable because it, the applicant hasn't got control of the land. I, I see the uh, points made on costs and uh, both parties dispute each other's evidence. But at the end of the day, that is, is kind of in a, in a immaterial because the development say, plan says X, that, that position has been shown to be acceptable by the statutory consultee. Um, Obviously, the other, I won't touch on, on going to greater detail on that really because of that position, but there are other issues with regards to the alternative um, access in terms of the topography of the site, which I'll show you some pictures, which does show um, quite a, a different grades, um, drops in levels. There's looking south towards the new development, looking across the open space. So there's the drop, there's essentially where the, um, the marker is, is where the, the access would, would come down. And there's essentially where the, the access would go through. So there, there is a, a degree of engineering works um, and um, 
the landscape character assessment or the site sensitivity assessment that was undertaken by us as a council said any new development should have regard to the topography of the site and the important um, landform and levels. So at the moment, the site essentially leaves that part of the land al alone, apart from a small area of housing here. But obviously, it's only an outline scheme, so the layout can be adjusted. But if there was an alternative access, it would, it would essentially breach that area. So obviously, on, uh, wrapping up on the access, obviously it's, um, it's fully compliant with our adopted policy, a very recent policy, and I have sat here at many committee meetings where we, we place great weight on our policies, and therefore it's, it's my view that there aren't any material considerations that would indicate we should, we should deviate from that position. And then obviously the, dealing with the other um, issues that are set out in the report, the um, further engagement has been had by officers with um, uh, KCC Highways and the KCC Economics uh, regarding bus contributions and um, uh, the school. Take it, taking um, the first one, um, there's uh, been no um, uh, confirmed by KCC Sustainable Travel Team that there's no need for a, a late night bus service and so it would fail the seal tests um, under the, um, under the, the seal regulations. Um, and also, it's worth noting, no other site within the areas had to uh, contribute to um, such um, infrastructure. Uh, the KCC economics were questioned about the, the, the Southborough contribution and, and why wasn't it Cox Heath. Um, according to them, the Cox Heath primary extension is fully funded through other contributions, and Southborough would be the, the next strategic expansion to take school children in that area. Um, having regard to the comments about the, um, the natural edge to um, the uh, LEMP area, um, this will obviously an outline scheme. Um, there's no conditions about parameters or anything like that. So this is essentially, apart from the access point, it's a blank canvas when it comes to the, the, the layout um, and um, sort of location of houses. So there's, um, the, this, there's a minimum of 1.8. Uh, he hectares of open space and a LEMP will be um, a landscape and ecology management plan needs to be secured by a, a legal agreement to give it more weight and uh, further detail of that um, area. So obviously the, 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 the position of the boundary can quite easily be um, amended to a more natural edge or, or other uh, uh, alignment at, at the detailed stage and the, the, the LEMP um, through the 106 can require um, planting specifications and other detail to require things like woodland and scrub for, for habitat. Um, so wrapping all those matters up, it is considered um, the, um, the matters for deferral have been addressed. Um, and obviously members have to make the decision um, on, on the basis of, of the development plan and, and, and other material considerations which um, isn't, there aren't considered any to deviate from the um, from, from that position. So I'll open it up to back to the chair. Right members, just to point out that there is an urgent update which you probably have noticed but just to mention that. Now I'm going to ask the legal officer to just outline very briefly how the public participation in tonight's meeting will work. Over to you, Ben. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a short announcement for members of the public and in particular those who are speaking on an item this evening. As you've just heard, the item is announced by the chairman and then the planning officer introduces the item. The chairman will then call the speakers. When you hear your name called, please could you come forward to the table in front of you and take a seat. To speak, press the middle button of the microphone. You don't need to hold it down, you just press it once. The button will turn green and the ring around the mouthpiece on the microphone will turn red. You will have three minutes to speak. I have a timer on the laptop in front of me and either myself or the chairman will indicate when your time is up. At the end of the three minutes, uh, when you finish speaking, please press the middle button again. It will turn white. 
and then return to your seat. You may hear some of the speakers referred to as visiting members. They are members of the council, but they don't sit on this committee. They will also have three minutes to speak, but they have no right to vote on any of these applications. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Garton, I see you've arrived and, and you're probably here for item 17 in Yelstead. I think it would be a while to get to it, so if you did want to uh, nip out for, for a more comfortable seat, um, it will be a while before we get to that one. So, uh, no idea, but it would probably be a couple of hours. But, uh, <laughs> right, sorry about that. But, um, right, we now move to our first speaker this evening. Well, Mr. Hawkins, the objector, I'm sure you, you know what to do, so if you'd like to come forward now. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, members. Um, as has been set out within the officer's report, um, the application was deferred by members to enable further negotiations to take place between the applicant um, and adjoining landowners in part to look at the access and to assess the viability of providing access through the, la the land to the south. Um, this followed on from a number of concerns raised by local residents uh, members concerning the use of forced or lane fall through traffic, the subsequent impact this would have upon Tobble and Lose routes perhaps not suited for, for a significant increase in traffic movements. It's noted the applicants have very recently submitted a review providing access onto Willow Grange and their interpretation of the costs of undertaking this work. It's just a few matters that I would like to clarify um, this evening. The applicant states the road isn't wide enough for additional traffic um, within Willow Grange. I think this is because they've shown it linked to the private drive rather than the road that was designed for adoption um, within, within their submission. Um, it's perhaps an unfortunate mistake, but it, it, it does obviously doesn't tally with perhaps what members were intending. Um, the highway to which members were referring within Willow Grange has been constructed to an adoptable standard um, and finishes approximately two to three metres from the site boundary. This isn't the, the, the road that they've shown on their plans as being, as being linked to. Um, the sales particulars of the development identified this as a potential link road through the development, so any potential purchases were made aware, certainly at the point of purchase. Um, and I can confirm that Countryside, and this was sent out to members of confirmed in writing, they do not have a ransom strip um, and would not, certainly would not indicate that because I say they've, they've made it clear all the way through that they would be anticipating the access to come through their site. With regards to the, the submission, the applicant states there have been an additional £360,000 worth of costs involved in this scheme. And for, to my mind, there's three points to consider here. Um, as I say, the costs relate to works which seek to link in with the wrong piece of highway um, and as such perhaps could be considered accurate. Should the road be f located further eastwards and link into the road that's constructed to an adoptable standard, this may well reduce the costs um, to the applicant or any subsequent developer. The additional costs that they have stated relate to internal roads um, and do not necessarily address the fact that should the access not to be onto Forstall Road, there may be a reduction in other road surfaces within the development space itself. These aren't roads that would be required outside of the application site necessarily. Um, and I think finally and quite importantly, the landowner has confirmed that whilst an initial starting point was given, that wasn't the final figure and he's still willing to negotiate. And he has stated that um, he would be willing to accept a cost that would ensure that the cost of the developer would be no more than developing forced or lane. So once the full viability appraisal had taken Sorry, place, Mr. that Hawkins, could be... I'll have to draw you to a close there. Understood. Okay. Thank you very much. Councillor Parker, Cox Heath Parish Council, please. Uh, Chairman, members of the committee, um, Coxheath Parish and its residents would still like to object to this application in, wholly in terms of its scale and its poor access. Um, we've talked about open space requirements. Um, just a bit of background, the Heath, Coxheath, was open space for many centuries. We're now talking about 200 houses on the last section of what was formerly open space anyway. As you know, to the south is the Greensand Ridge. We're very grateful that's now protected land. We had asked for that in the local plan, and we're pleased to see that it's taken place. 
To the north is the head of the Luz Valley, and I seem to recall Maidstone had a policy on protecting green environment uh, and green space running into the town. Uh, if you build on this, that opportunity is now lost. I've heard this, I heard at the last meeting, Cox Heath referred to as a town. We're not a town, Maidstone is a town. Uh, we've also been referred to as a rural service centre. On three times we've challenged that, and on three times we've, we've secured the position as a large village. Um, your planning officers say you take great weight on your policies. Your spatial policies are quite clear in that large villages should take limited development. Uh, this at 220 houses is roughly 12% increase. Uh, you seem to have not taken into account the other three developments, one of which has already been built even before the local plan had been approved. I do question what value the local plan is, if that can happen. Uh, moving on, you also have the policy of anti coalescence uh, This development quite clearly links Cotsheath to Lewes and takes away any open space or green boundary. I accept there is a small margin uh, to the east side. As I say, development 210 houses, 40 houses per hectare. We would challenge the highways access. I appreciate it's been referred to Kent Council's Council several times. If you do a simple search on Google and you say, how wide should a road be for two-way traffic? I think most answers come up at five and a half meters. And I do note that there are backland developments within Coxheath which have got accesses for five or six houses and the access to those is five meters wide. I did raise this point very clearly when the inspector came to Maidstone. Um, I was told at that time that it wasn't the planning department's problem to look at access. Uh, but the developer would have to provide suitable access, uh, and the inspector seemed to be quite happy with that response. Uh, maybe that's why he refused to take it out of the plan, as we'd suggested. Um, the development, as I've said, will sever green space between the Greensand Ridge and the head of the Luz Valley. Uh, it does not protect against coalescence, uh, and the local residents, I feel, have been totally ignored here. You've had over, or oh, sorry, nearly 400 letters of rejection from existing residents. Can you draw your remarks to a close, please, Councillor? Certainly. And there have now been 35 letters of objection, I understand, um, from new residents of Willow Grange. I see from the current report that there are various add-ons been okay. offered. A time, uh, Ms. Ca time, Councillor. Time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rigby, Lewes Parish Council, please. Sorry, I apologise. Crumbs. The idea of no right turn for the vehicles exiting the development may help, but traffic can still access it via Well Street. Also, knowing the traffic problems elsewhere locally, drivers will ignore the no right turn, which may prove difficult I'm to sorry, enforce. Sir, the microphone's on now. You don't need to speak oh, quite sorry. so loudly. Well, one thing or other, sorry. Well Street is a narrow single track lane with blind corners and few passing places. It's not suitable for an increase in traffic. At the north end in Lewes Village, there's a lot of street parking, making it narrow between vehicles, and the condition of the road is poor with slightly ineffective drainage. One of our councillors frequently walks Well Street, and when vehicles meet pedestrians, the pedestrians have to flatten themselves against the near vertical sides of the lane to allow vehicles to pass, because there are no verges. This dangerous occurrence demonstrates the unsuitability of Well Street for any increase in traffic. Furthermore, from Well Street, vehicles may try to use Busbridge Road, a rat run, which is narrow and in place dangerous, with sheer drops to the side. Questions also have to be asked about the known problems at Linton Crossroads. Traffic delays here encourage drivers to use alternative routes such as Stockett Lane, and the Parish Council supports the small, Smart Infrastructure Group in its criticisms regarding traffic flow research at Linton Crossroads. 
are other areas of concern that the MPC allocation of the site in the local plan was 195 dwellings, yet the developer has increased this to 210. The density therefore exceeds the 225 units per hectare recommendations by MPC for large villages such as Coxheath. The scale of the development potentially erodes the anti-coalescent belt between Coxheath and Lewes. Whilst planning legislation is clear that community identities should be protected, both Lewes and Coxheath are threatened by this potential loss. Major surface water flooding occurs from the development area, and the development plans even appear to recognize this in their lower layout showing runoff to the north. In January 2016, flood water from springs caused damage to Lewes village for three weeks. The development proposals risk worsening the situation and the Parish Council is not convinced that this issue has been properly assessed. Finally, uh, little seems to have been done to address issues of air quality and with the increased movements and also the Parish Council would wish to be assured that the previous concerns over bus services in South Maidstone have been met. We hope that Maidstone Borough Council addresses these matters with due consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hill for the applicant, please. On. Am I on? Can I start now? Um, chair and um, members of the committee, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the committee on behalf of the applicant Charterhouse Property Group. You will have seen that we have considered carefully all the matters which you asked to be explored when this application was deferred from your September meeting, and we have tested all the highways options, contrary to what Mr. Hawkins says, and hopefully you will have seen the 20-page highways report which has been submitted since September. You will also have seen officers clearly express recommendation to grant planning permission subject to conditions and the 106. As applicants, we find ourselves rather bewildered by the position in which we find ourselves, and I'd like to explain briefly why. This is not an ad hoc planning application, but one which has been formulated to respond directly to a proposal in the Council's own plan, now fully adopted as of the 25th of October, two weeks ago. The site, with access of Forstall Lane only, has appeared in every iteration of the plan and the studies which fed into it since 2011. There have been numerous opportunities for consultation and appearing in front of the independent inspector examining the plan for parties who wanted to argue for an alternative access strategy for the site, an alternative to the one promoted, that is, by the council. That moment has now passed and the council has directed that access be from the north avoiding breaching the fine hedgerow and valuable ecological corridor to the south of the site and indeed creating a 300-unit cul-de-sac off a single estate road. The other side of the coin is that the council has now lost the opportunity to require the Willow Grange site to the south to be built with an adoptable road right up to its northern boundary, hence the two ransom issues, and 110 houses have now been marketed, many sold and occupied in the expectation that there would be no vehicular access through Willow Grange from the adjoining site to the north. Development, yes, access, no. Now is not the moment to be lured off course by siren voices orchestrated, we believe, by the owner of a ransom strip who last week was seeking two and a quarter million pounds for a 15 centimetre wide sliver of land. We urge you to stay on course with the strategy you, the Council, have promoted, supported for five years and have now adopted, and secure the benefits now on offer with our application, which will deliver, as you will have seen amongst other things, 84 affordable homes, two hectares of a landscaped open space, and a substantial contribution towards the long-awaited improvements at the Linton Crossroads, which we will unlock. Anything else will delay the delivery of the benefits with significant downsides in terms of council resources and costs if we are forced to appeal. Lastly, we understand that planning committees often feel they are between a rock and a hard place. Can you draw your remarks? I can and I am doing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. The difference here is that the rock is a fully adopted local plan, the council's own development plan, 
which has been subject to five years of due process. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Councillor Webb, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members. As we know, the application has been committed before and was deferred pending the outcome of discussions regarding the alternative means of access to the site. We now have the report from the agents' consultants, Calibro, which uh, is detailed in respect of what was asked the committee before the deferral. Putting aside the Willow Grange issues, I am rather concerned about what is still missing from any documents regarding the application, namely the increased traffic that will use the roads and how it will disperse away from the site. The Calibro report does discuss problems at the various junctions around Coxheath and states how these are under capacity but will still get improvements. However, what I fail to see in any mention of Stockett Lane northwards and Workhouse Lane leading to Dean Street, East Farley, and then the, possible, the possibility of cars moving towards East Farley Bridge, the Hermitage Lane site to circumvent Maidstone and to reach the motorway network at Junction 5. These routes are down country lanes that have severe width restrictions in places, yet are seeing increased traffic problems which are not being addressed by the highway authorities. Another point in the report gives more details of the access onto Forstall Lane. However, what happens whenever one of our own Maidstone Borough Council dust carts wishes to go to Forstall Farm on the same day as collections from the site and the rest of Forstall Lane? It would need to turn against these restrictions, either going in or coming out. But it is now being prevented by the design of this um, junction. Finally, we notice the, the, uh, that the present application is actually a departure from the new local plan, as it asks for over 200 dwellings, where H158 of the new plan states that under 200 dwellings. This will give us, therefore, a different application and grounds to refuse the plan due to the over-intensification of traffic movements more than the local plan envisaged. And finally, the officer in his report mentioned about Southborough School getting the money. Um, it says, he said that Coxheath School was already increasing their uh, sizes, but we are going to be having 500 ho extra houses in Coxheath. The additional there have the County Council taken into account the extra of that for cold. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Webb. Councillor Mortimer, please. Right, evening, members, Chairman. May I just um, say to you, first of all, even though the local plan was voted on two weeks ago, there is a six-week period for a judicial review. Bear that in mind so it is not rubber-stamped yet. Secondly, I'm sorry I'm going fast, three minutes. Secondly, on the 106 agreement, I did tell officers after the last meeting that the reason why we didn't ask for money to our bus service, a late-night bus service, is because the other four applications were done 18 months ago. We had a late night bus service and it's only recently stopped and I would ask KCC to actually knock on the doors of the people in Coxheath to actually see there is a need for it so if it does get approved which I hope it don't you still should take a 106 on the late night bus service. Right let's go on to the highways the most important thing um, to have a sign from KCC saying unsuitable for traffic to go down Well Street it's not enforceable um, I would like you the members because I cannot ask the, ask the officer tonight what will happen when it does go down Well Street and, and goes to the single track road? What, is the, um, what will the impact be on the conservation area? Right, you come out the site again, you turn left. After a meeting with the KCC officer on site, where did he go? Up Mill Lane and through the estate to get to Linton Crossroads, which is exactly where Kent Highways say people will not go. Ask our highway officers tonight, where's his report to say when that does happen, and it will happen, what is the consequences? And on that meeting we had a few weeks ago, DHA, they're a highway expert, proved to you that through the estate those roads are not suitable by the highway standards. They cannot be upgraded and it's totally unacceptable. Ask the highways what happens when they go down Forstall Lane and turn right and go down Stockett Lane. There's nothing about 
um, going into tough formation on the short road. Very important. Ask them why they don't or they haven't included the impact on the caravan and camping site that has recently been approved in Forcer Lane that is going to create extra traffic. Ask them again why they haven't taken into consideration 77 houses in Stockett Lane, which is also going to have a very, very big impact. Members, you have got it here to refuse on highway grounds because of the lack of information that's come from Kent County Council. And I will say this, you're the ones that are going to get the flack for this, but it's Kent County Council have not given the answers, and I also don't believe the applicant has really gone far enough to try and resolve this. So in a nutshell, members, what is before you tonight should be refused and may I please just say Ashley you haven't shown the pictures of the badger sets which I have sent to you I would hopefully you will because there's badger sets all over that field which does have an impact thank you chairman members my apologies to Councillor Mortimer for not showing the very impressive pictures of the badger set but as you probably gathered we are having some technical issues with this system for not for the first time and I would ask members to show the politeness towards other people that they would expect to receive themselves Councillor Firma please Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members, um, for giving us your time again, um, another evening of your time. When you last met to consider the application, you listened to our desperate pleas for you to go against officer recommendations and vote against the development. You understood our concerns, and you took it away, and you've thought about it again, and I'd really like you to consider the alternatives. And speaking alongside residents of Coxheath this evening, I ask you once again to take matters into your own hands and reject the planning permission for this site with its current access. I know many of you have visited the site and know the area well, so like me, you will know that access onto Forsall Lane is completely inappropriate for a development of this scale. You have listened to the concerns of Lou's residents and how hairy the country lanes are if you turn right outside of the proposed site access. But I must also disagree with KCC's conclusions. The left turn is no better. Regardless of the proposed mitigation measures, it is unsafe. Either blind bends on either country lane or navigating up Upper Stockett Lane, a primary school in a dangerous junction. It's also impractical. Residents in the centre of the village are at their wits end with the levels of congestion as they are now. It cannot take any more. You've heard our concerns before and please this time reject the application with its current access on highway grounds. It's unsafe and our village just cannot cope with the extra traffic. And also while I'm here, I'd just like to ask about the youth services for, um, there's £8.49 per dwelling towards youth officer. Um, we're desperately in need of youth services in the village and it's been trialled before and they've had to stop it because of the lack of funding. And I just ask what actually can be paid for with the £8.49 per dwelling and if there's longevity there because it just needs a long-term financial commitment. Um, so that's just an aside, but please do um, reject the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Firmer. Councillor Mrs. Grigg, please. Good evening. I'd like to comment on the latest planning committee report and we'll start with a summary of reasons for recommendation which states the site is capable of accommodating the proposed quantum of development. Yep, there's absolutely no argument here, but the infrastructure, especially the highways, are most certainly not capable of accommodating this build. In para 4.2 it states, there have been no objections to the Forsall Lane access on highway grounds and this has been reviewed by KCC Highways and found to be acceptable. This beggars belief, as simply no one, including DHA Transport, found this access point acceptable. Last time this application was heard, I and others put forward a sound argument against the unsuitability of the forced lane access, and I'm very disappointed that the deferral time does not appear to have resolved any of the raised concerns. I note that the report has reviewed the financial implications for an alternative access route and states the costs of the new access are understood to be more than the access to Forstall Lane on account of required engineering works. So, it's acceptable for the residents of Well Street to have their quality of life ruined and Busbridge Road to be destroyed because this developer is unable to budget the additional cost and ensure a profitable delivery. At the end of the day, if the developer wants this build, then recommend that the extra finance is found. 
Para 4.3 of the report says, on account of the forced to lane access being acceptable in principle, there have been no studies to properly assess the impacts of the alternative access, and thus any amendment to the scheme would essentially require a new application and cannot be simply amended. If this scheme goes ahead as it is, it will be the residents of Lewes and Cox Heath that will be paying the price. So let's take the time and get it right. I implore that the committee refuse, request a new application, and ensure that a correct assessment is carried out. 4.6 continues. The access design has been further discussed to prevent access through Well Street. A sign was suggested last time, so what's different? The only acceptable solution is to restrict traffic from travelling north on Well Street beyond the Gordon Court entrance through the provision of a no-entry sign supported by advance warning signs at Forstall Farm. 4.7. Why is the only suggested expansion for education south for a school? I ask the committee to consider even more traffic travelling down the back roads to Maidstone. Last time, on behalf of the residents of my ward, I asked for this application to be deferred, not refused, until proper, workable and funded mitigation proposals were provided. This report proves that it has not been possible to do that, so in order to protect Lewes Village from total chaos and devastation, I am now asking for an outright refusal on highway grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Greg. Well, as the, as the uh, vast majority of the content of the speakers has been uh, addressed to the highway issues. I think the appropriate thing at this point is to ask Mr. Wright of Kent Highways uh, what his response. Who? Oh. On, on this? Sorry, Councillor Willis. Um, I completely uh, overlooked the fact that you wanted to speak on this application as you're not on the list there. Hello, committee. Um, I speak as transport spokesperson, um, and I'll try and be as quick as possible. As a Lib Dem transport spokesperson, um, I'll try and be as quick as possible. But this application, uh, my study of the section 106 money, and I'm very willing to be corrected by the officer. Uh, our draft cycle and walking strategy, which is a major part of our local plan, and very much part of modal shift and safety, healthy, health and walking in the borough, um, asked for, a, um, asked for a, a commitment towards uh, the Cox, the RD9 is the policy, the Coxy Sustainable, uh, sustainable um, Transport Package. Um, within the documents I've found, and I'm again, very quickly willing to be corrected, I can't see a contribution towards cycling or walking. There is mention of access to a path, but it doesn't refer to the, the policy. Um, and also, I notice that the provision of a formal footway, and in our local plan, it refers to a provision of a formal footway link between the site and Mill Lane. Now, I'm ready to believe that I may not have found that in the documents, but I'm, I think this application, I wouldn't recommend it, frankly, because I don't think it actually follows our local plan in terms of sustainable transport. Thank you. Thank you for that interesting and slightly unexpected contribution. As I was about to say, um, so having been blindsided by the fact that he wasn't actually on the speakers list that, that I've got here, I'm, most of the comments that have been made, including that last one, relate directly to uh, Kent Highways, and it seems appropriate to start with Brendan Wright from Kent Highways and see what his response is to those points, including that last one. Thank you, Chairman. The Highway Authority has to assess each planning application on its individual merits. And in this instance, the applicant has proposed access via Forstall Lane. So we have had to review and make recommendations on the suitability of that particular access arrangement. The applicant has satisfactorily demonstrated that an access junction onto Forstall Lane can be designed in such a way that will deter movement to and from Well Street. And they have achieved this in the form of a junction configuration coupled with a priority working um, that will physically um, divert movements to and from the development away from Well Street. And that's an arrangement that has also been subjected to a road safety audit. 
Alongside that, the applicants have proposed to upgrade Forstall Lane to a standard capable of accommodating two-way traffic flow, and they have proposed a new pedestrian footway along Forstall Lane. Alongside that, they've also proposed to realign the Forstall Lane junction with Stockett Lane to improve visibility, and all of those works would be secured via a Section 278 agreement with the Highway Authority. Turning to the uh, traffic impact across the local network, clearly there is the likelihood of development trips uh, using a route such as Well Street to move to and from Maidstone. And indeed, they, there's a likelihood they would use Stockett Lane for that, that similar purpose. I think the key point here is that the incentive for those routes to be used is reduced if effective mitigation is provided at the Linton Crossroads in the form of junction capacity improvements. There is therefore an imperative that this development contributes to those improvements via a Section 106 agreement. All things considered, there are therefore no grounds on which to sustain a highway objection. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'm sorry, please. This meeting will be conducted without interjections on, in support or against people who are speaking. Mr. Wright, before we go any further, um, concern has been expressed by a number of councillors and members of the public about um, the consequences of the access being on Forstall Lane, despite what you just said. <coughs> um, and I think the last speaker, sorry, next to the last speaker, Councillor Grigg, referred to um, possible mitigation measures. Are you confident that, 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 we, that Kent County Council Highways have done enough, or are, are there further mitigation measures that, that could be put in place? given the great concern that the public have expressed? I don't think there are, Chair. Not, not that could be reasonably required of the applicant. Um, as I explained, that there are already substantive works proposed to bring Forstall Lane itself um, up to an appropriate standard. And clearly the contribution to the Linton Crossroads Junction is particularly important in terms of providing access to and from the primary road network. So I think that the package of uh, measures that we've recommended be secured um, is appropriate. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wright. Councillor Harwood, I think you were the first to indicate. I'll take, uh, sorry, I, I, sh I was assuming, perhaps obviously, but I should still have asked that every single one of us has been lobbied, is that correct? Yep. You're quite I should still have asked. Councillor Harwood. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, since we discussed this item last time and agreed to deferral, and indeed since our last planning committee, essentially everything has changed when it comes to our decisions because we now have an approved local plan to which full weight must be given. This is an outline application with only the means of access as detail. And the problem is, it's not our committee, we're a regulatory committee who are duty bound to make our decisions in accordance with the development plan. But in their wisdom, the council generally and the policy committee has agreed a policy which states that access will be taken from Forstall Lane only. So, from a highway perspective, that there is no way that we can use that as any form of objection. We, we cannot object either to the principle, because again, the principle is agreed. Um, it is outlined, but there's a suggestion that 210 dwellings would be progressed. The problem is Maidstone Council has the wiggle room that we state approximately. And you know, that's the other issue that we're faced with. So in terms of uh, at the legal position that we're in, we must as a committee, as a, regu uh, as a, a regulatory committee, um, which is quasi-judicial, make a lawful decision and we must make a reasonable decision. 
and this will have a bearing on so many applications. I think we've got another one coming up at the next meeting, which will be exactly the same now we've approved this local plan. I think we did have the luxury because there could have been changes up until two weeks ago. Now there will not be. So frankly, with an outline, there, there, is, very, there is no wiggle room, there is no debate. It, it, the only thing that we can look at is, is trying to look at any new evidence and to seek to nuance the, the detailed application which will follow. Um, when the, the notion of this site being allocated came up back in about 2011, um, Councillor Mortimer kind of showed me around the site and showed me where the various badger sets are and everything else that's in here. And, um, and, and that, because they are a protected species under the um, 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, is a, a, is a legal responsibility upon us. Therefore, I, th I think in terms of the detail that we can look at and we can change, it relates to the open space issue. And I don't think we do necessarily just leave that down to what turns up in the LEMP. I, I think we need to look at experience elsewhere. And, I, and I, at the last committee we discussed this, I talked about Grove Green, where we had a similar issue. When the Grove Green estate was, de was de de developed, the site hosted badgers and badger sets. Those badgers are still at Grove Green because we were very careful about the way we landscaped them. And that was through the phasing issue in that we ensured that there was phasing which made sure that we demarcated the open spaces right at the outset and that they were protected through the construction phase and that we actually put the planting and so on and actually formed those open spaces um, so that they were becoming mature by the time the development was actually completed and residents were moving in. That currently, we have no reference to that demarcation, protection and phasing. And if we're not careful, we're going to have a construction compound on the open space, which will be there till the last house is probably built. So I think there is, a, the, the is some legal and regulatory backing for, for bringing in detail um, from that direction. I think the other issue that we can look at is the interrelationship and symbiosis with other policies within the local plan and the countryside protection policies and the anti-coalescence policies again I think the, the important element of that links into this open space in that we need to create a line in the sand so that we don't have continuing expansion um, heading down towards Lewes and, and, and then we just we end up with a a, a Beersted or a Grove Green, which has been kind of absorbed into urban Maidstone. So I think because we have no choice, I, I'm, I think we, we have to move that we, we grant permission. But I do want that landscaping condition to be to introduce a reference to phasing, to demarcation and phasing at the beginning of the scheme, and so that the planting of that perimeter open space to demarcate the edge of the village and to provide a receptor and a safe area for the, for the legally protected wildlife. I think we, we can do that. Legally, we can do that. So with that change that I would like to hear the, the officers provide um, some uh, kind of to flesh that out and how that is actually delivered, I, I, I will move to, just to move us on because we've got a number of applications tonight where we're in a very similar position. Let's hear what, before, let's hear what the officers have to say on the LEMP. I'm too, I too am concerned that we don't end up with a sterilised strip of nothing when we turn, by the time we finish. Mr Wynne. Um, well, just, just before I get onto the LEMP, I, I just thought I'd deal with the badgers as, as referred to by uh, uh, um, Councillor Harwood and, and uh, Councillor Mortimer. Um, there are a number of sets uh, throughout the site, um, um, uh, Councillor Morton mentioned the um, new sets in the north of the site. When I went down this, uh, this afternoon, there's actually a badger set in the middle of the alternative access route. So they, they're a healthy, I, 
I've forgotten the term for badges. I won't say pride. That's lions, isn't it? But um, um, there's a healthy um, population of badges on the site. Um, and I have spoken to uh, KCC Ecology about the mitigation. They're comfortable with the um, significant amount of open space on the site, that there can be um, more than adequate um, compensation, mitigation for that, and the creation of a good habitat. Uh, like, uh, in terms of the limp, rather than just a, a planning condition, that is to be skewered by a legal agreement, much like um, another notable application recently in Linton. So it's a very strong limp requirement in terms of submitting information. Um, there's phasing of implementation, um, ecology mitigation built into that planting specification. So it's a very robust LEMP process. Um, and obviously, as you say, the, the, um, the, um, sort of the, the outline nature of the scheme allows the reserve matters to be treated alongside that LEMP process, which will require um, uh, submission of details prior to commencement. So uh, the way I would expect it is the LEMP is considered alongside the detailed uh, reserve matters stage. So it's a coherent strategy uh, and obviously uh, so sort of the, the ma maximizes um, sort of biodiversity and landscape improvements because it's a very, very unique um, landscape there. If you've been down, you can see it's a valley formation and the, the way the applicant has a, a approached the um, master plan is to respect that landform. Although I appreciate further north, there probably is opportunity to soften the edge, bring it in so you've got less impact on, on the well, uh, forceful lane um, side. So, yeah, from, so, so obviously um, from the 106 it will be secured and there is a condition also on the badger mitigation strategy which requires um, that to also be um, put in place. Oh, just to, to, to add to that, I mean obviously on the next, uh, next item agenda we've got a similar issue in terms of the LEMP provisions where they've come forward, come on alongside the reserve matters. So. You know, in effect, members in, have the confidence with the LEMP coming forward through the reserve matters that those protection measures are put in place. Uh, I'm not professing to know the details of the, of the LEMP provisions as set out in this um, application, but quite clearly you can have that protection in place that runs alongside the reserve matters. The applicant's going to have to come in with the reserve matters application. You're only considering outline tonight. Uh, and that LEMP provision can be those guiding principles as they are through some of the other applications on this um, agenda tonight. So I, I think the answer to a simple answer to the question is yes, we can add that additional level of controls in through the LEMP to make sure that those protection measures are in place when the reserve matters application before development is, is constructed on site. Councillor Harwood. I don't want to prolong this. So uh, what are you saying, that you will build into the narrative of that condition a specific reference to the treatment of that open space and so on, which, and its timing and its phasing, which, which will govern that issue. So it just tightens up so that we don't have the, the ubiquitous construction depot issue or, or any damage in the interim, because this is really quite important. If we don't protect the site at the outset, we will lose that value. And the planning permission is very different from the start on site and there are all sorts of issues and we've seen them all over in our wards all over the borough so I just want to ensure that it's absolutely watertight because I think this application stands or falls on that large boundary open space from a number of perspectives and yeah so so if what we can that but will that paper how will we do that are you going to write something now or Councilor, is it Councilor going Harwood, to I, I, come back? I would imagine that we would amend um, the third paragraph of recommendations 7.0 on page 78 and to include the wording that you w were indicating. Sorry. Yeah, is that I, right? I mean, quite clearly, um, we could because when we draft up the 106, you've got the LEMP provisions in the 106 agreement. Quite clearly, within those requirements, in the detail of the 106, you can require those measures to be put in place and when they come forward. So to add clarity to that, the simple answer to your question is yes, we can do that. Okay, I think that's answered that question. 
How about the way I suggested it? That would be the simplest method. Well, what I would suggest on that, and that adds to the, um, the overall issue in terms of the recommendation, because if we were going to go down that route, what I would ask is that I get delegation to the Head of Planning and Development on that exact wording for that Section 106, because I want to make sure we get it right. Um, so I would request that there's a slight change, that there's um, delegation to the Head of Planning to allow that to come forward, and we will work through that exact detail. I know exactly what members are try seeking to achieve on that. They want those protection measures in place before development starts. So I'm very aware of what we've done on another site. I won't go into it, and I know what members are asking for tonight. So if I could request that delegation, um, we will ensure that we negotiate that into the 106. Thank you very much. That's very clear. Right, moving on. Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I agree with what, much of what Councillor Harwood said. The principle of development has been established here, and this is a shame that the, um, the policy in the local plan perhaps didn't consider the relationship between the Willow Grange site and this um, site more. Having said that, and I, was, I think it was mentioned in the report, obviously, um, something which I'd like a bit more clarity on is, this, is the ransom strip, basically, and the idea of sort of connecting the two sites. The residents in Willow Grange moved into what they thought would be a cul-de-sac, um, as I think was, was mentioned um, before as well. So this doesn't come without objection. But I think there, there's two ransom strips, or there's two owners of, of ransom strips here, and it was mentioned in the report that discussions had only taken place with uh, the owner of one of the ransom strips. So do we know why the other owner wasn't consulted, or... Um, and perhaps, I don't know if we're able to, Mr Chairman, but it'd be helpful from my perspective before voting if we were to know, to be able to see a close-up of the map and who owns what, if at all possible, um, just so that we know, because as, the, as Mr Hawkins said, um, there are different areas in which any proposed access could come through if this committee was minded to go down that route. And the second question I've got is with regards to the access onto Forster Lane and this interesting idea of a priority junction, as has been proposed. And I was racking my brains before the meeting trying to think of examples around the borough of, uh, of a junction like this that works effectively. And I, to be honest, couldn't think of one. one. There's a very odd, it's outside our borough, it's on Tunbridge High Street, Mr. Wright might know what I'm talking about, or Medway Wharf Road, which is a priority junction like this and works appallingly badly because everyone just turns right out of it anyway. Um, and Tunbridge and Morling Council have built hundreds of flats down there. And I can see exactly the same happening here, to be totally honest with you. I think, I, as was asked by one of the speakers earlier, how on earth is this going to be enforced? What's the, are we just going to put a sign up? What's the deterrence for, um, for not doing so? Because Though um, there might be sort of some traffic furniture in the middle of the road indicating that it's easier but not in, to turn left, but not impossible to turn right, ultimately, if you're still going to get queues at the Linton Crossroads or in the middle of Cox Heath to get to Maidstone, you're, still, you're going to take that risk and turn right anywhere. So I'm, I'm afraid, Mr Chairman, I think we need far more clarity on the design of this particular junction because as far as I can see at the moment, it's, um, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, may, may I be sure what you're saying, uh, Councillor Bolton? Are you saying that it's actually wor potentially worse than not putting it in at all, for example? So I can just get my head around that. I actually think, I think I'm unconvinced at the idea that this priority junction will actually make any difference at all, to be totally honest with you, because I think people will turn right out of it anyway. What I really want to know is how the design of this will ensure that people do not turn right and use Wells Street and lose as a rat run. That's what I'm interested to hear. Thank you very much for the clarification. I'm going to take Councillor Mumford before I ask officers to come back because that may cover some of the same ground. Councillor Mumford. Yeah, we voted the plan through and uh, this at the moment is, is acceptable and we really need to approve it because it complies with our plan. However, and this is a big however, um, I looked at this and why did we look at Forstall Lane? Let's go back to the basics. And the reason we looked at Forstall Lane was because when we did call for sites and we took our local plan through, it had to be deliverable. 
And the only way that you could make this site deliverable was on Forstall Lane. Then we were lobbied, etc. And the opportunity, and this is where I, I go to the officers, we now have a material change since we wrote the plan that we are allowed to consider. And now it is possible to approach this site from the south, where it wasn't when we wrote the plan. It had to be deliverable. It is now deliverable from the south. And so it was me, because I wanted to protect Lewes, Tovel, and the centre of Coxheath, improve the traffic calming on Heath Road that asked for the referral. You know, we do have a change, and that is we can approach it from the south. So the developer, and thank you very much, went away and looked at the viability of that and came back and said, this is not viable. And I was completely happy, and therefore it should go to Forstall Lane. But I don't know how many people have analysed that viability. And that viability is on to a private road which is not adoptable standard. So they've got to bring that private road up to adoptable standard when they could have looked at two roads that are adoptable standard. And I think, why are they doing that? Well, it can only be to add costs and mislead me. And so I must make my own conclusion. And I listened to Mr. Hawkins tonight, and Mr. Hawkins indicated to us, and the letters we have been received through lobbying have indicated that on viability grounds, there will be no cost crossing one or possibly two, but I disagree with the two from what I've been told and what I was told tonight. So I have a material change from the local plan. I can enter from the south. I am not convinced by the viability study at all because of the way it's been put together. The only thing that I do take from the lobbying that the developer's given me, that 30% he's expecting 30% of the traffic to go south. Because he says, if, sorry, to go north. And that would be through Lewes and Tovel. And the developer is saying that himself, because he says, if I do use the south, it will add 30% to the Heath Road. So it doesn't dissolve, it goes north, if we use Forstall Lane. I believe there is a material change. I will support Councillor Harwood in the approval. However, I would like to see a condition because we are discussing access tonight, because of this material change that I consider there is, that it is now deliverable from the south, and the condition should be that the site is only accessed from the south. And that's what I'd like you all to consider. The, we're all talking about lose, I mean, that's a gem. We, we shouldn't lose that. They will go down Stockett Lane. We can improve the traffic's calming and hence the, the problems along Heath Road if they come in from the south. And I am asking for a condition to be added that it is approved and that it is approved but a condition is added that it can only be entered from the south. I'm not convinced by the viability study. I have to bring the officers back in, but uh, I can't see that that would be legal. But I'll get the officers' opinion. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to go back to take members back to the um, Mr. Hawkins's letter that I know all members have been uh, lobbied on this. And in the uh, bullet point, uh, bullet point four, he does sort of indicate. And he says there's no reason that a fresh application would be required. Well, I would wholly disagree with that assessment because an a new application would be required. And I would fundamentally say to members, one, 
that you are asking to consider this application and the only thing you are considering tonight in terms of the principle, as I said, it's an allocation. It is within the settlement boundary, so it's not in the countryside. You are considering the access, which is the access along Forstall Lane. So you could not impose a condition that will require an access coming off Heath Road. That is certainly something you could not do. So unfortunately, Councillor Mumford, I would have to say that the recommendation for officers is that would be totally unreasonable and notwithstanding that, the main thing you are considering, as I said, is access off Forstall Lane. So, one, I would totally disagree with what Mr. Hawkins has said, and I'm here to professionally advise members here tonight, and I think on that basis, hopefully that's quite clear. I would maybe also ask, if, there were, if it's all right with the chairman, a number of other questions were asked uh, in relation to that, and if I can ask the case officer to address that particular point, or at some of those points as well. Thank you. Mr. Wing. Right, the, the question was asked about the ransom strips and um, sort of the, the degree of, or the size and, and where, where they are. Essentially, I've got a plan here, which is, um, but essentially it's on this boundary, you've got the 15 centimetres of one ransom strip and then the land between that and the, uh, the road is, is essentially owned by countryside properties. Uh, as you will see in the information that was submitted uh, as lobbying material, there's a letter from Countryside Properties suggesting they wouldn't um, uh, take um, any money for that. Um, but obviously, um, that, there's, that, that's just uh, a letter. It's not legally binding. And so, as I said in the report, the fact of having two ransom strips not under control of the applicant essentially makes the site undeliverable. Um, I think the other just uh, picking up on a point about a viability assessment um, submitted with the application. Um, all, all that was done, the costings were for the alternative access. It wasn't a viability of the development. And obviously having regard to the fact that the um, land isn't in control of the applicant, and obviously they held the meeting, but there wasn't, um, as officers, it's not felt it's reasonable to require a full viability assessment when um, the alternative isn't deliverable and it isn't the application in front of you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. I wonder if there's a point that, that was raised by Councillor Mumford that, that I think may need some more clarity. Um, we talk about the weight of the... I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Clark. I can't hear a word you're saying. Could you possibly sorry. speak a bit nearer the microphone? A point that you're always doing that. A point that Councillor Mumford had mentioned that I think needs some more clarity is relating to the weight of the local plan, um, specifically with regard to perhaps in this case access, where a more suitable access becomes available in the duration of the local plan period. And I just, I think this is going to come up over and over again as adjacent sites are built out. And I wonder if we can have some clarity about the weight of the local plan as it is, as opposed to a potential more beneficial situation as we go through the local plan. I think the problem is whether it's really available or not. But um, Mr. John. Um, yes, precisely. It's, um, I did actually um, give evidence at the um, public examination on this site as well as other sites, and I actually mentioned this site to the south, and the inspector quite rightly said, is that within the um, landowner's control? And I, I said no. So the, the, only, the only access on the table, as it were, at the public examination is exactly the one that we're looking at tonight. I make no comment on the detailed design, but the question is, is the proposed access safe or not? And you've heard from the highways officer that in his professional opinion, it is. Okay, Councillor Cox. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I've listened to all the speakers very carefully. I've written a lot more notes than one normally would, actually, because they brought some really good things up. We've, we asked a direct question, is the mitigation enforceable? And I didn't hear an actual answer to that. All I heard was, I've looked at it, and everything that we've set out is fine. That's all I've really got. Um, the study of the alternative access I really thought we were going to see a lot more information before us on the screen so the public could see 
exactly what has been proposed, what was looked at. We've got two blobs of yellow showing the two pieces of where it's... I really wish we could zoom in on some of our pictures because I'm having difficulty, and if I glance that way, I'm sure a lot of other people are too. So I do think we've got to get this sorted out once again. But the access points on to the actual site is what I thought we were going to be hearing about. I would have thought in the time that we would have spoken to all the landowners. We would have found out exactly what it's going to cost. And I believe we heard earlier from um, somebody saying that the landowner has said they will agree to a price that would make it no more expensive than what has been proposed. Well, if I don't see that's being amenable, I don't know what it is. Lastly, it's said here that KCC have just said to us, all that's been considered about the access I find sound. Well, I really don't see that the proposal of the design and putting a lovely no right turn, as we've seen, actually, you don't have to go so far away as where you said in Tunbridge. Allington is where we've had one, and we passed it, and it was coming out of the BP garage. I've seen people turning right with rather large vehicles. And I think we need, we are a committee that is going to pass this just by what we've been shown. And I need to see, we've been talked about, you must have evidence. I agree, and I don't think we've got all of it before us. Lastly, if we do have to pass this in its current state, I've just looked down the, one, uh, well, the 106, and I think the comment that's been made about youth services is wholeheartedly correct. What on earth can you do with £8.49 per dwelling? Well, they might be able to take them down the coast for a fish and chips or something, but I really don't see that. We've got costs here going into the library, which agreed always needs new books. Um, but I do think we need to look at that more carefully. I think the costing that's gone into here um, for the uh, youth services, if they're failing, we need to bolster them up. But I really would like to hear more than we've heard already from uh, Mr. Wright, because it's almost as though we've said, please go away, come back and tell us your findings, and he's come back and gone, yes, it's all exactly as I thought. Thank you very much. On, on the um, Section 106, Councillor Cox, I, I think a lot of scepticism could justly be expressed about some of the things that the County Council do ask for. I, I think Councillor Round and I were discussing this earlier on a, on a request, a very similar request in Headcorn, where there's no youth service delivery in Headcorn. There's precious little in Coxey. We all know this is basically a subvention for the central fund of the KCC to, to run its central service in Maidstone and has no relationship whatsoever to, the, to this application. Um, and it's not the first um, <coughs> Section 106 request of that type we've, we've had. But, so, yes, I think we do need to be asking questions going forward of some of the um, Section 106 requests we're getting from the county as to whether they're genuinely still compliant or, re or, re or relate in any way whatsoever to the actual application. Um, turning, to the, turning to the highway issue, the problem we've got is... <sighs> Unfortunately, from a strictly planning law point of view, and planning law is a flipping ass sometimes, um, well, a lot of the time, frankly, all that's required is for the county council to say as the highway authority that the access proposed is, in their view, safe. Unfortunately, much as we might like it, uh, we, might like it we can't compel a different approach. But what perhaps is worth exploring at this point is because doubts have been raised by Councillor Borton and new Councillor Cox, I think, about the right turn, sorry, the no right turn um, uh, roundabout and, it, and the, priority, the priority roundabout, how robust can that be made? How can it be enforced? If we're relying on this to make this access work, how can it be made to actually be enforceable? Because I think the councillors from Allington will tell you We've got to have a little bit of a problem with the BP garage one, which was supposed to be the solution to the problem there. So if, can you help us out on that one, Mr. Wright? 
Yeah, the, the issue of enforcement only, only really comes into play when you're bringing in a traffic regulation order that prohibits certain turning maneuvers. So in this instance, that would be turning maneuvers to and from Well Street. Now, that doesn't need to be form part of the, the access design for this site. Um, and really what, what the applicant has proposed alongside that is, is to actually physically and visually deter movement to and from Well Street, not just in terms of movements in and out of the development, but also those that, that, are, that are moving in that, in that direction from Forster Lane at the moment. So I think by, by achieving a design that is self-enforcing, we, we, we have a suitable access arrangement that we think is workable. But would it not be, sorry, I'm going to pursue this point. Would it not be wise to perhaps think ahead, that may be a nice change in local government, and, and think, okay, that's what we want. Suppose it doesn't happen, perhaps we should be mon putting a, mo a monitoring exercise in place a few months afterwards to see if it has happened. And if it hasn't happened, actually seek that traffic regulation order and the p enforcement potential. Can't we actually, if, if it works, Mr. Wright, we don't need to worry, do we? Um, it'd be fine, it'd be brilliant, Abs everyone would be absolutely happy. Um, if it hasn't, that monitoring exercise will throw up the uh, uh, traffic regulation order is needed. Is that unreasonable? I, I, I think perhaps we should look at that. By all means. We've had a very good idea that's come to us from um, the Lewes group, um, which uh, has said it should just be no entry. So if you come out of there and you're turning left, left is all you can go. If you turn right, there's a very good no entry sign. And I think that would be the most enforceable because people really do take a bit more care of red signs than please don't turn right. Mark, if it's on this point. Quick, yeah, I think that we, we, we've got to be very careful because residents of Well Street may, uh, currently have the benefit of using Forstall Lane in that direction. So if we do put a no entry sign there, I, I think that's going into a completely different realm um, than we might want to be getting into at this point. Uh, Councillor Mumford, if it's on this very point. Yeah, on this very point, um, Lewes Parish Council represent Lewes parishioners and Lewes Parish Council are saying put a no entry sign in there so um, and I know people that live down Well Street and they'd rather see the no entry sign than, than what is being suggested at the moment if we've got authorities representing communities i.e. Lewes we should listen to them Members, I can see um, where you're going with this. I think we need to give the opportunity um, for KCC Highways to answer that. What I would request when the KCC representative answers that, does it meet the necessary test to make the development acceptable in planning terms? So I think in terms of when the KCC Highway does answer that, in terms of a restricted access, because that seems where members are saying no right turn, it needs to meet that test in order for it to be effectively applicable. So if I could then ask Brendan or KCC to answer that question and, and the chairman's request, please. Well, in terms of mitigation of traffic impact, it's, it's reasonable for the access design to incorporate features that will deter a particular movement, and that's what the applicant has done in this instance. I think when we start talking about making particular roads no entry, um, that raises all sorts of other issues about displacement of traffic and, and, and inconvenience to those people that are currently using those roads. Really, the, the approach that we, we try to adopt, and this is no different, is to actually 
get the right solution in place up front. Now, the, the, the design of the access that has been put forward incorporates a double, double height curb that will physically make the maneuvers to and from Well Street impractical. That is what the applicant has put forward. I think when we start to get into the realms of monitoring how an access is performing and with a view to taking retrospective action, that sets an unwelcome precedent. I think it's about getting the design right up front and we clearly have an opportunity to refine that through the, the Section 278 process as is necessary. But we, we have the principles in place already in terms of what's been proposed. Councillor Clark and Councillor Bolton. The, re the reason I wanted to respond to Councillor Mumford is um, the problem about the bees, would you speak I, into the microphone? I am speaking into the mic. I, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, so my issue is that we, that we don't have a proposal in front of us with no entry as it, as it stands. Um, and the problem with, with a no entry and, and design of a highway on the fly in a planning, in a planning uh, session is if we do make that no entry, I, I, I do understand that residents have concerns about traffic going, going that way generally, maybe not just from this, this, um, uh, this application site. But my, my concern is if you look at Pilgrim's Way over at Kitts Cotty and you look at the speed that cars go down there when they know nobody's going to be coming in the opposite direction, if we all of a sudden put a condition to say no entry, I think it would very much change the dynamic of this road for residents. And, and I'm, I'm cautious about that. And that's the reason why I wanted to come back after Councillor Mumford. Indeed. Um, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bolton and they were try and draw this particular issue to a close. Accepting what, what's been, been said already and the fact that this is an outline application for 210 dwellings and taking Mr Bailey's point that is it reasonable to displace traffic across the whole of South Maidstone as a consequence of this, it comes down to the design of the junction, which was a point I made in the very instance. And what would be, and the answer to this question I'm sure is no, but it's disappointing the answer will probably be no, because it would help inform our decision making, is can the officers, is there a model of this junction? What does it, what does it look like? What's it made of? Is it, is it brick? How high is it? Is it going to be possible for the cars to go over it and turn right? Or will there be a bits of furniture in the middle which will make it physically impossible to do so? It's kind of hard to see from any of the designs we've got up there or from the um, original lobbying, but can we just have some sort of detail on the scale of this particular bit of traffic furniture which is proposed to stop people turning right? Because that's, that's my real sort of concern rather than whether we have it as a, as a sort of a no entry sort of or whatever was discussed before. I quite Councillor Bolton, which is why I put it like I did, that we should hope that the County Council, as the highway experts, have got it right, but that we should have some potential course of action um, available in bringing forward a traffic regulation order. Yes, I can see you. Um, for for um, it to be brought in if the roundabout doesn't work in the way that we should say I, I, that it's intended. And I don't see why it's so difficult to monitor it and, and to see whether actually the County Council have got it right and to see what action would be taken, could be taken. Any traffic regulation order would have to be consulted on and all residents would therefore have an opportunity to have a view, view on that, wouldn't so it? Wouldn't be, so it wouldn't be imposing a particular solution. It would give an opportunity to adjust this roundabout and other two events. And I don't see that's particularly unreasonable, um, to be absolutely honest. And that was what I was trying to do, to accommodate members' concerns and to actually do what we can in a limited way, and it's, it's flipping limited, to try and do something to... I'll obviate the problems that residents will face. Councillor Mumford, I'll take you back briefly. I'm sat here listening to everyone talking about Forstall Road. I believe that's a mistake. Um, 
I don't accept what's been said to me so far. So I'd like to propose we refuse this application on access because there has been material change since it was put on the local plan in that there is now the opportunity for a southern access. The reason I'm saying this, what we decide tonight will be forever. And I still believe that there is the opportunity for a southern access. We need to protect the conservation area of Lewes and we also need to protect Tovel. We have an opportunity here and the decision we make tonight will be forever. So I'm proposing we refuse it based on the access because that is an opportunity for a southern access. And I don't think we should ignore that and spend this evening trying to cobble together something that none of us want. Well, I'll bring the officer in in a minute, but um, first I'll ask if that's seconded. Not at this point, we'll return to it. But I would caution members that, that we have to determine the applications that are submitted, not better potential applications. And that, that's the law. We have to determine one way or other what, what is put before us. We can say all sorts of things, but what we can't do is give us a reason that there is a better solution available. It can't, you, we can't do that. We can, if you are convinced, Councillor Mumford, that the, this access that's proposed is unsafe, if you're convinced by, uh, against the advice of the Highway Authority that that is the case, then you're entitled to that view. But you can't use the, an, the fact that there's a better alternative available to refuse it. I'm sorry, you can't. Councillor Mumford. Then I will amend that, that uh, the single track roads that lead off of this access, being Wild Street and the one that goes down into Tobble that escapes me, um, uh, it's unsafe. It's, un yes, Stockett's Lane uh, down through Tobble. It is unsafe to direct traffic down those. And I also feel that we have a responsibility to protect the conservation area of Lewes and I feel that this access will actually damage the conservation area of Lewes by introducing traffic into it. Councillor Harwood has been very patient. I'm going to bring him back now. As he's okay, sorry, I thought you, you had indicated again, but if you want to wait, that's fine. Mr. Bailey. Can I, um, before we go further down this, I just, I didn't want to bring case law into the case, but um, I'm going to have to raise, I'm going to have to raise the issue in terms of um, the statutory consultee and, and the, the High Court decision in Peter John Steer versus Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government um, uh, and Bivalley Borough Council versus Historic England 2017. Now, quite clearly, and just to give members the remit of where that stands, um, in terms of the statutory consultee, you've heard from KCC Highways who is the statutory consultee who said that it is safe. Um, in terms of the access arrangements, it's safe. They are satisfied that those arrangements that are put in place down uh, Forstall Lane are safe. Now, that decision that I've just referred to, which was endorsed by the Shadewell Estates decision versus Brecknell, uh, Breckland DC, that the decision maker should give the views of the statutory consultees great or considerable weight, and a departure from those views requires cogitant and compelling cogent, I always get that wrong, requires cogent and compelling reasons. So, what we've got in front of us is the statutory consultee who says it's safe, and we've got a proposer who's saying that the um, recommendation coming forward for refusal that that lane is unsafe. Now, obviously, in light of those case law High Court decisions members, you've got to make that judgment. My view as the officer recommending that is that that is not a defendable ground of refusal. Right. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak at this point? Councillor Clark. But... 
So I, I have a question to officers. I think one of the best examples of, a, of an intersection which prevents traffic turning that I know of is at High Banks, which happens to be in Lewes. As you come along High Banks to join Old, Tubble, uh, sorry, Old Lewes Hill, it is extremely difficult to head north towards Maidstone. Now, I, I, I feel it would be very difficult for us to, to design the, uh, some major change to this um, junction by doing no entry one way or, or, or whatever. But I do think if we should give ourselves the ability to do something better that's, that's, than what is on the papers here. And I do feel that there is an example where essentially we do get what we need at this junction and I think that there should be ways in which we can explore the, the possibility of, of maybe a much shallower angle onto Forstall Lane to make it extremely difficult to, to, to get down Well Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could I direct members' attention on page 84 to condition 21? Um, now, the condition, is, as, as members will be aware, that um, obviously we, we don't use uh, pre-commencement conditions or the advice on the MPPGs, we shouldn't be using this in exceptional cases. So this is the exceptional case where it says no development shall commence on site until there's been a 278 agreement signed. Very rarely would we actually require a 278 to be signed because technically you'll be saying that that's in the hands of KCC and no disrespect to KCC, that may take a long time. So the very nature of that particular condition is worded in such an extent that it is quite restrictive on the developer. We then go to the first bullet point, the alterations to Forstall Lane in junction with Stockett Lane. So there again is a, a key requirement. Now if members were to address, you could expand that condition to make it more onus and that would be to, you know, effectively to come up with a design would actually, you know, re, you know strongly deter um, uh, the right-hand turn, um, and notwithstanding that, the other suggestion that you could come forward, which is picking up on the Chairman's point, and, and not part of this application, but you could have a second resolution after you've made a decision on this application, asking the JTB that obviously, once this development is uh, up and running, that that junction is looked at um, in terms of to see where the traffic is turning right. So it wouldn't be a, a decision making as part of this committee, but it could be a recommendation as part of a second resolution, because I do understand the concerns that members are raising here. I'm here to try to find, you know, what are the solutions that would hopefully address some of those concerns. And as I said, a, 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 a second resolution to ask JTB to look at that once the development is up and running to see whether that becomes an issue could be something that with it within members' um, powers tonight. So hopefully that gives you some way to deal with some of those issues moving forward. So does that give us the ability to specifically say that we're looking for a much shallower angle onto Forstall Lane it, tonight as a condition? I, I think we should be as specific as, as we can reasonably be, otherwise we'll just end up with a restatement of the current position. Um, but, uh, um, Mr. Wright, is there any reason you would not uh, see us uh, take forward that possible suggestion? No, it's, it's clear that members feel strongly about this issue. Um, as I said earlier, there is scope within the Section 278 process to refine the design. So it would be about shaping it in accordance with members' wishes. Very well then, Mr. Clark, um, sorry, Councillor Clark, um, would, you like to be, um, would, you, would you like to be reasonably specific without tying our hands too much? Uh, so that we know what, I would obviously where you're seek going. Officer, um, uh, officer input in terms of how, we, how it would be worded, but essentially, um, if, if you look at the, uh, the bottom uh, row of pictures, the one that's second in from the left, um, No, that's, the one. <laughs> that's fine. That's, that one's fine. Okay. So if, if you, if you um, look to the left-hand side of, of the access into the site there and you consider making that much, much 
more shallow an angle. So you are, you are almost parallel with Forstall Lane as you come out. So it, it curves in such a way that as it intersects with Forstall Lane, you are almost traveling in the direction of Forstall Lane at that point. Okay, I'm, I think we understand where you're coming from. Councillor Bolton, very quickly, is your this original? Yes, okay, in that case, can I suggest that if there is to be some traffic furniture in the middle of the highway, does it be raised so that people can't drive over it? I think officers are understanding where we're going with that, and so are KCC Highways. Councillor Mumford. Um, because I can see where this is going, um, Councillor Mortimer brought up a point about the late night bus. And the reason for refusal was that the other sites had not been asked to contribute. And he pointed out to us that they were um, they went through while they had a late night bus and subsequently lost it would this make any difference to that decision made by kcc i would have thought it would but let, let's find any comment on that mr wright i mean you wouldn't contribute to something that already existed quite um we certainly have a of every sympathy, you know, in terms of wanting to improve the local bus services. I think the difficulty here is that we can't justifiably require it for this development. Um, simple as that, really. Shame, because it would seem a great bit more useful priority than spending money on youth workers in the middle of Maidstone. Is there nothing we can do to, to pursue the uh, bus the transport situation? Because we've now got a a local plan with a supporting integrated transport for, uh, approach which suggests that we should be doing more to promote modal shift including bus services and of course when we when these other allocations came forward we didn't have an adopted local plan with those supporting policies Yeah, within the 106, there, there is a, um, a requirement to secure a, a full travel plan with a £5,000 monitoring fee. Um, the, the applicant did submit a framework travel plan, so obviously the, the full travel plan will um, address modal shift and everything else with a with monitoring fee for the County Council to ensure um, those uh, objectives are being met. Um. I used to be a planning officer, but I'm not a great deal further forward following that explanation. Um, what I would say, Mr. Wynne, is, is there any possibility in the travel plan of addressing the, this, either this issue or bus services more generally in Coxheath? Because, frankly, that will seem more useful than some of the other things that are suggested. I think the answer to that could be yes, because you could be looking at, you know, subsidised vouchers in terms of what you're going to put into the travel plan. So the simple answer to that, Chairman, is yes, you can add some measures within the travel plan that require subsidised um, bus travel. Now, if that's the requirement that members are, are saying they want to be added in, then I see no reasons why you couldn't require that. I think... I think you should, because the travel plan thing you put there was decidedly lacking on, shall we say, content. Councillor Harwood. Thank you. Right. Th thank you, Chairman. I mean, what, one of the reasons why I and many others had real, real problems with the, the volume of housing growth that has been promoted in Coxheath is that Coxheath does not have a railway station, it is very reliant upon the private motor car, and we are finding that the new development which is taking place in Maidstone is attracting more vehicles than per household than we have within the indigenous population, if you like. That is just a fact. That's what's coming out. You go up to any of these new estates and see how many cars there are there. Um, I am very, very concerned, and this links into Councillor Willis's point, that we are creating, through the access and other issues, a very car-dependent new housing estate where, essentially, these, the people who buy these houses, they're going to be people who probably have a, you know, will drive off to work distances or they will go to the train station at Staplehurst because they're not going to get into Maidstone. Uh, and, and, and therefore, 
I, I need to know how are the children easily going to walk to Cornwallis Academy? How are the ch primary children, hopefully, be walked to the primary school in the village rather than go in the multiple four by fours that nearly took me out when I was wandering Forstall Lane around Rush Hour looking at this, actually looking at a lot of people rat running down into Well Street, I think. Um, yeah. But, but we, we have got we, we've got an outline application, we've got the means of access, but the means of access is a means of access and egress for cars. What about anyone who's not in a car? And I, and I think I need to understand that as well, because that will influence the reserve matters application that comes along later in terms of where is the, 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 you know, the permeability in terms of, of pedestrian cycles and so on. And I think that's a fundamental issue we've got to bottom out. Okay, I think that's very important and we do need to, to, to address those things now. Otherwise, as you say, they won't be taken board. Yes, yeah. Um, while the officer, because Councillor Hardwick, if that's all right, the officer will address that point um, and he's got an opportunity to look for that. Can I just, um, I just want to clarify well, are you ready for that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll hand over. Um, as you can see in the, um, on the um, eastern boundary, there's, there's a footpath link, and, and condition two uh, refers to the need to make that a bound surface, which should then link into the footpath on the um, uh, Willow Ground, Grange Estate. And so there's um, access to bus routes on uh, Heath Road, much as the new estate approved to the south also has similar access. So there is um, links through, and then obviously on the, um, on the northern boundary, there's the opportunity through via the new footway to then walk through the estate um, to, to the wider village. So the, the actual um, pedestrian links are covered or can be covered in the reserve matters stage, and obviously the travel plan can deal with um, um, efforts to um, encourage such... Um, so walking and, and uh, other sort of sustainable means. Now we do need to need to draw this to a close, but Mr. Jarman, I... So I'm um, following up on your point, um, Chairman, about clarity, really. Um, you know, clearly members are aware that on other developments, um, large and small, we have... Um, uh, secured contributions via uh, Section 106 agreements for improving the frequency of buses or the duration of bus services. So um, could the case officer clarify whether or not um, a head for the Section 106 would meet the three tests of um, planning obligations? Okay, in respect to the bus contributions? Or Um, and I think um, um, at least two members have referred to um, the need um, for a late night uh, bus service. So it's, if councillors could have um, sort of closure on that issue. Yeah, as it was one of the deferred issues uh, last time round, I did uh, talk to um, the uh, sustainable travel team at, at KCC about the uh, necessity for that um, and the answer was there wasn't a requirement, and, and therefore, from my point of view, that yeah, I can only take advice from, from, from the experts, and, and obviously, um, so it wouldn't be seal, seal compliant. At the end of the day, Mr. Jarman, I think I'm going to go out a slight limb on this one. We are being it may be too too difficult to, uh, to say it must be specifically a late, late night bus because of the very specific answer. But we require, uh, I think as a committee, we would be remiss in not requiring there to be a contribution to bus services and we can talk about the detail. But it, there needs to be a requirement to bus services because otherwise I'm actually going to say that we could actually I say that this isn't policy compliant because it's unsustainable. Okay, so that would be ahead. And the last point for, for myself is a very, hopefully, very practical point. Um, and I think um, Councillor Firma mentioned 
um, this. Um, I'd like, basically, I'd like um, flexibility to achieve objectives. For instance, um, we're very specific in terms of £8.49 uh, per dwelling for youth services um, in the Cox Heath, for Cox Heath youth workers. So I haven't, if, if we managed to get £8.50 per dwelling, I would have to come back to planning committee, and I, I would have thought that that, quite frankly, was a waste of public money. So I'd like that, I'd like that flexibility to achieve the objective of, um, for example, um, trying to negotiate a, a robust amount for, in this instance, um, youth services in the Cox Heath area. More flexibility, that's what, what I'm asking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry on this youth services thing for Cox Heath. I, I think the committee want to know that this money is actually being spent in Cox Heath, if it's going to happen, because frankly, I am totally unconvinced by any of these county youth service requests. So... And, what, and, if, and uh, to be honest, I would have preferred to see this money going to, to additional contribution to buses or, some, or something flipping useful. I'm totally unconvinced by this youth service one. So, so Rob, if this isn't being spent in Coxheath, I expect to see, I, I don't expect to see Section 106 contributions requests like this again, uh, and we should be looking at uh, money be actually being spent in the area, because I don't believe for a moment in this. Mr. Cox. Thank you very much. While we're on 106, I actually glanced across the page to page 79, where I just want clarification. It says a financial contribution of £63.56, which amounts to some £13,300, per dwelling is sought for the social care and Trinity Foyer Sensory Beds Rockery. Is that in the one in Maidstone? Or is I'd that... A Thank new you. One that we're having Thank you. In... I was coming to that, um, and that is my last point. Right. I am a member for High Street Ward, so I might get shot for saying this by some of my constituents, but I cannot see for the life of me how an open space requirement in Church Street in the centre of Maidstone relates remotely under the seal tests to Cox Heath. How the... I'm sorry, I was going to say something rude there. It, it, um, it's not that the money isn't needed for the sentry beds and, and nurse and rockery in it, there, but f I'm sorry, there should, if there's an open space contribution, um, which essentially that is, because that's a, that's a part... Yeah? No, 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 well, if that... that well, I'm sorry, but... How on earth does a social care um, contribution in a park several miles away relate to Cox Heath? I don't get, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, don't see how that works. That, that's another example. I was just seeking greater flexibility not to be tied to the exact wording of those bullet points. Um, members, fine. obviously, what is before you tonight, if members decide that those contributions aren't warranted or they don't meet the tests, members are perfectly capable of turning around and saying, we don't agree those meet the seal tests. You are the decision makers, and if you decide that you don't consider that youth services towards Cop Heat are going to meet those tests, then you've got the ability to turn around and say, we don't want to secure those contributions. Likewise, with the financial contribution of the other one. Obviously, the officer's report sets out that he considers that SEAL compliant, and KCC have given a SEAL compliance test. But quite rightly, you are the decision makers, and you can make that decision um, as you have done on many other occasions where you've switched those contributions around. So in terms of as long as they are still compliant and as long as they meet the 122 tests and the 123 tests, then you're perfectly capable of doing that. All I want is to, that those wordings to be amended so that the money can be spent in and around Cox Heath and up, that means taking the specific reference to Trinity Foyer out 
at this particular instance. So I'm quite happy for the flexibility. And Councillor Round indicated then you. Th thank you, Chair. I mean, on, on the subject of youth services, I have to say this is not necessarily particularly relevant to this particular application, but it's come up at this application, is that num numerous conversations have taken place between Chair and myself and indeed the spokespersons group over, I would say, probably years, quite frankly, um, even in the days of the scrutiny committees. The subject of youth services and funding youth services and our relationship to do so and the way in which we do Section 106s and any other form of money for youth services is certainly something that we need to consider. And in this, in this particular case, we can only do what we're doing on this one today, but it is a subject that we do need to raise in terms of spokespersons group in the next few months. Thank you, Councillor Rand. I agree. Councillor Prendick. I think if we give the, Mr. Jarman the flexibility he's talking about, both our viewpoints can be considered and the appropriate action taken as a result. Uh, Mr. Councillor. Thank you very much. You, I we will, yes. Well, I hope so. The more I read, the more it jumps out at me. Um, the financial contribution of £360 per person towards health care on Stockett Lane. Why have we changed from per dwelling? How do we know how many people are going to be living in these houses? So, I mean, we've got per person towards healthcare and Stockett Lane Orchard. Is that per person on their books? Um, the, the NHS consultations, the NHS consultations come through specifying a contribution per person and setting out a formula, as it's an outline application, setting out a formula that where it's a two-bedroom flat, for example, it's multiplied by X, where th th there's a predicted occupancy rate, and they start from the point of per person. We then put a formula into the section 106, which says when the application comes through for reserved matters, if it's th X number of three bedroom houses, this multiplier is used. For four bedroom houses, that multiplier is used. So this is actually the, the correct wording that we would want to see in the report for an NHS contribution. Thank you very much, that's very helpful. Right, um, Councillor Harwood, uh, you've moved it, but it, there have been some changes. So bef before we do anything else, I'd ask Mr. Bailey to outline what those are so we're all, all aware, because it's been a long and complicated discussion. Okay, I, th I think they are quite, um, there's quite a lot of discussion on it, but the key issue is um, delegated authority to the head of planning and to development to give him greater control and flexibility over the actual contributions um, that are set out in the heads. So that would be on, pay, on 7 zero. the first recommendation would have delegation to the head of planning and development. And there are, what I've picked up is two specific areas that, um, that members, I'm not saying they'll be the only ones, but two specific areas that you've asked us to look at, both the financial contributions of youth services and social care and the Trinity Forest Century Bed. So in effect, the delegation you're giving to Mr. Jarman would allow us to go back to those stat consultees and interrogate them further on those matters. And we want to make sure we do get a contribution to bus services. Yeah. With regard to the issues in terms of the additional delegation would be the, the, the um, request for contributions towards buses, uh, which would be an additional head. And in terms of condition 21, what I would suggest in terms of 
I would, in terms of the wording of the condition, it should say, no development shall commence on site until a signed Section 278 agreement covering the following. So delete is finalised and ready for signing. And then under the first bullet, po sorry, under the second bullet point, any alterations relating to the access and highways to the site with measures to strongly discourage vehicles along Wells Street. So you're adding a much greater emphasis in terms of when the 278 agreement comes forward. Now those are the alterations that I have got. Did you get Tony's original point about the landscape? Yeah. yeah. You've got the original. Do you, want, do you want to make that clear in terms of the, the head of terms for the length? Yeah, okay, sorry, I did forget in terms of the point. In terms of um, the LEMP provisions, that there are the mitigation measures put in place prior as part of the LEMP provisions prior to works commencing on site. So in terms of using the BS standard fencing and in terms of the other mitigation, so that would be set out in the LEMP and, and very clearly emphasise that they'd have to be put in place before works commence on site. Can so does that cover the matters that members were addressing. I think so, but I'm having some members indicating, so I'll just check. Councillor Mumford first. And... Okay. Yeah, it's just that I'm not familiar with an S278, and I know that it needs to be signed. Signed by who? Who gets the input to say that the discouragement down Wall Street is sufficient? Uh, to answer your question, the 278 is negotiated with Kent Highways because they are the Highways Authority, so that's their mechanisms, 278. Can't, hang on, Councillor Mumford, the unusual thing is actually you're requiring it to be signed rather yeah. than delegated and left to be worked out M later. Members were very concerned tonight about the arrangements being put forward. And so you pointed us to that signature but KCC have already agreed and would be willing to sign what you were concerned about. And we are saying there that we just make sure that they sign again. Well, they can sign what there's already there. It's, n it's no comfort to all the members that were concerned about them turning down Well Street. Well, I, 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 I think the wording is about as strong as it's legally possible to get, but, but, but you know, Councillor Clark, I'll tell you on. The, the thing is, strongly discouraging people from turning, it's very subjective, and, and I I'm not sure that really captures what we, we discussed okay. earlier. I think if we say preventing, for example, um, creating an access which is almost parallel to Foster Club in the westerly direction, I think that would, be a, that would give much more of what we were trying to achieve. You, it would be, I think, within our powers legally to do exactly what you're saying and point to a suggested, a suggested solution, and that would be much more clearer and carry more weight and coherence forward. Um, so are you going to propose that amendment? Uh, well, I, I, I will get the exact. What, what is being suggested, I think, is a very is a much narrower, uh, shall we say, bend. But let Councillor Clark explain it, as he's familiar so with high banks more than. It, instead of instead of saying strongly discouraging a, a, a left turn, it would be um, create a, an access which will. Enter, enter Forstall Lane to, uh, in the direction, in the westerly direction, where it is almost parallel at the point of access, therefore preventing a right turn at the entrance into Well Street. Into Wall Street. Yeah. In other words, we're redesigning this thing. I, that that minimises any consequence with current road users, because I think that's the, the risk, is that we go beyond what we're trying to achieve. Um, but, but essentially, we're, we're looking to, at the point at which you leave this development, you are leaving at a point where you are almost parallel with, with, um, with um, 
I, I think we are, we're aware of what you mean. We, okay. We'll have to work on that wording slightly, but... To, uh, to prevent uh, the right. Yes. Uh, um, would you be able to accept a delegation to, to, to work on the actual detail of that, given the uh, parameter that's been set out? Can I just... Is that acceptable to Kent Highways along those grounds? Can I just get that clarity? Oh, well, yes, in the sense that it's not far removed from what's already proposed. Right. So it's, it's the recommendation will be amended to incorporate a delegation for, the, for our officers to work out the precise wording to, to bring forward what Councillor Clark has proposed there. I think that's much, it does take on board what Councillor Month was saying. Councillor Butler, as you haven't spoken before. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, it was mentioned about a referral to the JTB at some stage. Oh, I am coming to that. That would need to be a separate motion. But do, do not fear, we will not leave this debate before we discuss that matter. Councillor Harwood, briefly. Thank you. I mean, as, as the original mover, I think it's important to get this right. Uh, presumably, the access will have to go through a safety audit if it is revised. The reason I say that is that the, the, those who represent um, Head Court Nolcombe will know very well that there is one of these very um, kind, of, kind, of, kind of open junctions near um, Cowslip Cottage at the end of Windmill Hill and Lenham Road. The problem is cars go along it very, very quickly and therefore, if you're a pedestrian, they join the traffic and there's near misses there all the time because the cars feed into the lane at high speed because, the, because of, the, because of the, the acuteness of the angle. They're almost carrying on like it's the, the highway. And it's a particular issue for pedestrians who are trying to walk up that little very, that lane. So I think there's some real safety audit issues here that need to be considered if you've not got proper broken white lines or whatever and you are stopping traffic at the junction. So I am a little bit concerned about us kind of you know, morphing into highways engineers when this is already a lane which has traffic moving at high speed on it. We're going to be putting more pedestrians onto it because we've just said pedestrians who are going to be heading towards the village are going to have to come out of this access egress walk along a little bit of Forstall Road and then come into the, the older estate to get to Heath Road as the crow flies. So I think there are real safety concerns. That's, that's one issue. The, the other point, coming back to the ecological management plan, I think we need to be quite careful here. We're talking about the phasing, the demarcation of the habitats within it, we're talking about its protection through the development and also we were talking about ensuring that it, the open space is not just a lot of mown grass, that it's woodland so that it safeguards the badger population by providing the cover and so on. And that was the reassurance I think we need and I, I'm giving delegated powers for. I mean, it's very specific issues. And then the final point, which was something that Mr. Bailey missed, was the point about the concern about this being a totally car dependent enclave. And if we are going to get the access to the bus stop Heath Road and towards Cornwallis Academy, if you like that south west, no south east link, I, I need to know that we're actually being prescriptive in terms of our conditions that we are gonna get it, that we're going to get it and that it's identified in a condition and outlined um, so that when we get the final scheme, we have got that permeability for pedestrians. So, so I, I need to understand the detail for that is right, and I also need to understand the detail for this, for the, for the southwest, which, so going towards the um, village, that that is sorted out as well. I, I think it's really important that we actually, we're not just worrying about the cars getting in and out, we worry about the pedestrians getting in and out of this development. Bolton, and then I really am gonna... Can I just ask Councillor Howard as a mover whether he'd accept um, that we perhaps add an informative to this based on the discussion that we've had so far that we get all reserved matters back to this committee 
um, just on a, on a whole variety of issues as well. I think that would be quite useful because obviously a lot will be determined at that stage as well that we're concerned about or may be concerned about. I, I mean, what I would say is that it would be a reserved matters application and therefore it will be a different application and, and presumably the parish council and presumably we will ask or the, the world councillors were asked for it to come back to committee. I think it's difficult, you know, to, to, to actually kind of um, ensure that at this point, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very open to it, but I think it'll happen anyway. Councillor Harwood has, 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 shall we say, amplified and reiterated his original landscaping condition and the point about the footpath axis. Are we able to incorporate those points in full and have you got them written down? Uh, yes, we are. They are partly covered, but they would be covered under that scheme of delegation that you're giving to the head of planning to make sure that they are, are, are covered more fully in the conditions that are set out. I can say in terms of the informative, you could request as well that the reserve matters come back if should you so wish. That could be another addition that could be added on. I don't see why yeah, I can, I'm happy to do that. And, and, and I really do want that pedestrian permeability to be made absolutely prescriptive. If this is going to be a sustainable development, you know, you, you can't have everybody hopping in their SUV to go to the shops in the village. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we've got that. Right, is that clear? Councillor Cox, do you very Very brief. small, and I know that uh, Mr Jarman did nod when I mentioned it. Um, we have had representation from the three ward councillors and the parish councils. I think when we're talking about these 106, they have a lot of on-the-ground information, such as the orchard surgery may even be closed. Um, so I think, it, could it be in consultation with them? And they did nod, so thank you. I don't see why not. It would be helpful. Anyway, is everyone clear on where we are now? Right. As it has not been formally seconded, I, I will formally second what's on the table now, just to move it forward, because, or not, as the case may be. <clears throat> is everyone clear on what we are potentially voting on? Section 106 provision. Okay, right. All those in favour of the somewhat amended recommendation, take, please indicate it. Those against? Abstentions? Thank you, members and members of the public and parish council for visiting members for your patience for what has been a very long discussion, but had to be, I suppose. We'll now uh, um, take a... Um, I, that's what I'm saying. Uh, no, but we will, we will be taking a short minute break while anyone who wishes to leave wishes to... I'll, Yes, well, perhaps they might, but some people had already started leaving. We are going to discuss the second part of this debate now, so if people from Coxheath do want to stay for, for that, but I don't imagine it will be controversial. It has been suggested that we make a reference to the Joint Transport Board to monitor the effectiveness or otherwise of the measures put in to prevent the right turn out of the newer development into Forstall Lane. I think that would be sensible. I'm hoping that the revised scheme put forward by councillors will work, and that, but we have to have a, a fallback position if it doesn't. Therefore, I'm proposing from the chair, and I hope I will see a seconder, Councillor Bolton, thank you, um, that we, uh, with, that we refer to the Joint Transport Board and ask them to appropriately monitor this um, junction improvement, for want of a better term, to see whether it is working effectively and whether any changes to need to be made or traffic regulations introduced after the development. Now, should that be full occupation of the development, Mr Bailey, or, or, or is there a more appropriate... Uh, 
indicator. Um, in terms of your suggestion, I mean, obviously, you know, I would suggest there needs to be up to a certain level. So you could suggest, you know, 50% occupation, which, you know, it needs to be robust to see what's happening. It's an application up to 210 dwellings, so maybe 50% might be reasonable. I think that would be better because if we wait till full occupation, it could be a long way down, down the roads, so to speak. Right, that's been proposed and seconded. Councillor a suggestion. Could we specifically ask that it, could we specifically ask that it be put on the work program, and then it would be, there'd be a placeholder in the in the agenda for this when it comes around? I would hope members are all in, in agreement with this, and we do not need to spend long on it. All those in favour of the recommendation? Thank you very much. That's unanimous. It always helps with these things. We will now, well anticipated earlier, Councillor Bolton, take a 10-minute break. I believe that uh, that will be, require us to adjourn downstairs as committee room B has the overflow in it. There's no one in there. So, so we'll, we'll still have to go downstairs.